Erkin, welcome to the Brussels uh, Press Club for uh, this uh, uh, conversation on Azerbaijan and the European Union, the path towards an enduring relationship. First of all, uh, Erkin Gadirli uh, is a lawyer. Uh, he studied at Baku State University, uh, after which he was a lecturer uh, at the same university for 12 years. He participated in the Azerbaijan delegation during the negotiations of the uh, setting up of the International Criminal Court and uh, contributed to a scholarly volume called Commentary of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And he served also for some time as external consultant to the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, King Gadirli is co-founder and currently board member of the organization uh, Real, uh, which is one of uh, Azerbaijan's most uh, interesting uh, and active uh, uh, civil groups. Ekin, we're talking about Azerbaijan and um, the European Union. President uh, Ilham Aliyev was in Brussels uh, earlier this year, and during his visit, it was agreed to initiate uh, discussions on the new framework agreement between uh, Azerbaijan and the EU. There are huge expectations on both sides as to where this agreement uh, can go, and there are also expectations, at least on the part of the European Union, that the process uh, of negotiating the agreement would also impact positively on a number of issues in domestic uh, politics in Azerbaijan. But before we go to the essence of, the, of the, what is being discussed, can I ask your views about what you think of when you ask, when you ask the question, is Azerbaijan a European country? Do you have a clear and definite answer for it? Uh, first of all, Denise, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Uh, I take this as a very important opportunity to widen the general context and understanding of, of the audience of, uh, about Azerbaijan uh, specifically and the, the region uh, in general. Uh, your question uh, takes us back to the heated debates in the early 90s when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and there were discussions in the Council of Europe uh, what to do with the new uh, post-Soviet countries. There were no discussion about uh, Baltic states, uh, Belarus and Ukraine and Moldova. Those countries were uh, by default accepted uh, as uh, belonging to European geography. As to the South Caucasus, uh, there were doubts. Uh, many politicians and experts express their doubts that uh, if South Caucasus uh, geographically belongs to Europe or not. But then um, the Parliament and Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, at the end of the 90s uh, uh, take a, a decision, took a decision that uh, yes, these three countries should be uh, uh, regarded as European. And uh, in the early 2000s, all three countries were uh, accepted as full members of uh, the Council of Europe. So, in fact, we, uh, uh, in, to cut it short, we could have stopped there. But I understand that the debates uh, has arisen, have arisen in a very specific and uh, a new context of certain security issues, uh, Russian foreign policy, uh, Europe's dependence on the Russian energy supply, uh, some new conflict that arose in the post-Soviet area, and uh, the reviving uh, of uh, the far-right politics in, in European countries, which questions uh, the European Union's own policies about its immediate neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> as for our own understanding, um, my personal view is that uh, in issues like this, uh, vocation is much more important than location. Um, so, uh, Azerbaijani elite, uh, since the, I would probably say, the second half of the 19th century, always associated uh, itself 
with the uh, general worldview of the European Enlightenment and uh, strives to uh, spread those ideas uh, within the country, which ended up successfully in 1918 when uh, uh, the first Azerbaijani Democratic Republic uh, with a parliamentary system was established. Uh, and the elite was uh, clearly uh, European-minded. Then Soviet Union uh, turned uh, or it's back to the Europe and then closed the country and the identity was uh, changed. Now after the Soviet Union, uh, we didn't have really much debate in, in Azerbaijan about our own uh, identity. It was taken for granted. Some circles like religious circles and uh, non-democratic elites, uh, they do sometimes question it or at least provoke this uh, try to provoke this debate that to what extent we are European. And that also has to be taken into account in a wider context because you have to carefully uh, look what has been uh, happening in Turkey, for example, since uh, AKP become uh, a ruling party because uh, uh, Turkish government also uh, criticized the Europe as a Christian club and they send the message that Turkey is not accepted because it is Muslim and because it is Turkic. So that discussion somehow influenced uh, Azerbaijan because of the Turkish uh, uh, cultural uh, influence of our country. But also Russian, uh, since Putin became uh, president, they also positioned themselves as not a European country in a way that they are opposed the Western Europe, at least, the, the, they have their own civilization. So Azerbaijan is a bit uh, culturally uh, in between uh, Russia and Turkey, great neighbors, which owned our country uh, at different times of the history, which we have to take into account. So uh, Azerbaijan is trying to maneuver itself in a very uh, uh, difficult situation. Intellectual uh, elite in Azerbaijan uh, has no question about that. We consider ourselves as a European country, which doesn't make us some people uh, try to provoke the debate about uh, the European identity in details, like to what extent, that could be debated, of course. But geopolitically, or even uh, in terms of, uh, I would say, uh, political ideals, um, opposition in Azerbaijan, civil society in Azerbaijan, uh, intellectual elite in Azerbaijan it, it consider itself as part of the uh, European uh, space like uh, again intellectually we are more linked to Europe than to anyone else that's that's for sure but uh, some sometimes this debate is provoked by policies of other countries not only Russia and, 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 and Turkey for example for American for most of the American politicians Azerbaijan is considered to be part of the Middle East and they even their websites, when they enter uh, American news websites, uh, they by default identify you like Asia. So <laughs> somehow you find yourself in Asia. So uh, that's their choice. We, we, we don't have uh, any uh, chance to influence their decision. But as to us, uh, we uh, view ourselves as a European country. So a European country that is now engaged in negotiations with the European Union, uh, for an agreement that will define the relationship uh, between the EU and Azerbaijan for at least the next decade. Uh, what importance do you give to this agreement and to the current negotiations? As we know, the discussion started already, uh, but there's some way to go still. There are many issues uh, still under consideration. Uh, there are different perspectives in terms of what this agreement can look like. Uh, but what are your own views about what it should contain? I take uh, any opportunity of engagement with Europe as a, a very important step uh, uh, towards further development of Azerbaijan. So uh, I am 100% uh, supporter of uh, uh, widening and deepening relations with the European Union. Um, and of course, what makes us as, as an opposition or a civil society a bit skeptical is that uh, the whole process is not transparent enough. Opposition and civil society uh, is, seems to be isolated from
from the process, uh, from both sides. Uh, well, the government, for its own reasons, does not include opposition and civil society in the wider dialogue. And also European institutions uh, are hesitating to do the same or are reluctant to accept opposition and civil society as a counterpart. Uh, they do engage with opposition and civil society, but mostly on humanitarian issues, uh, in, on human rights problems and democracy, which are very important, of course. But uh, our opposition in Azerbaijan has to say a lot on major political issues. Um, so I would suggest, uh, if I may, that European institutions pay much more attention to Azerbaijani civil society and uh, opposition to find a way to include them into a dialogue uh, in, in, in a format which could be suitable for all sides of the negotiation. Now, Azerbaijan was offered an association agreement that uh, uh, similar to the one that was signed recently with Georgia. But uh, like Armenia, it decided that it didn't want that kind of agreement. Uh, do you think this was a good step, or uh, was this a missed opportunity from your point of view? Uh, I must say that in the society, in the civil society, in the opposition, this was taken as a missed opportunity. And the government in Azerbaijan was uh, heavily criticized for stepping out of this format. Um, but uh, the government, of course, has its own reason uh, for its own power interests. Uh, not to, not in, seems to be not interested in uh, introducing and implementing democratic reforms which are in the package of Eastern Partnership Agreement. Um, they don't say that uh, openly, but uh, you can understand uh, their concerns uh, with regard to keeping um, uh, power consolidated, uh, not sharing it with the society at large. Um, but what they say in public some of what they say in public seems to be rational. And uh, that uh, first connected to the Karabakh conflict. And the other one, which they uh, don't say openly, but they say it indirectly, is a threat from Russia. At least uh, Azerbaijan saw what has happened in Ukraine. And uh, that was a message, not only to Ukraine, but also to others. And uh, many in the society believe that if uh, now cl closely watching the process in Ukraine and the success of European Union or NATO or West at large in Ukraine would be a, a good sign, an indicator uh, for other countries willing to co further cooperate with the European institutions. Because if the European Union fails in Ukraine, that's a disaster. And that's a very bad message for our region as well. Uh, as for Karabakh conflict, I don't know, you, you, maybe we could talk about it in, in detail later on. I could all, the only thing I could say about it in this particular context is that Azerbaijan, not just the government, but the society at large, has always been waiting for a, a, a signal, a message, a rhetorical message from the Europe, uh, identical to which the Europe uh, uh, sense to about with concerning the conflicts in other countries, for example, when they say about talk about m conflict in Moldova, they always say that uh, they recognize the territorial integrity of Moldova, including Transnistria. When they talk about Georgia, they say that they recognize the territorial integrity uh, of Georgia, including Abkhazia and South Ossetia. When they talk about Ukraine, they always indicate that by territorial integrity, they also mean including Crimea. When it comes to Azerbaijan, unfortunately, we have never heard uh, from any European politician or institution uh, a solid position uh, on that. They only say that, yes, they recognize territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, but within which borders? It's a very vague statement. Uh, the whole society in Azerbaijan expects the European Union to be more uh, concrete and more conf uh, send a more confirmed message. That yes, they recognize Azerbaijani territorial integrity, including Nagorno-Karabakh. Then it, I, will, I can assure you that that will boost the, the European aspirations in Azerbaijani society. 
But for now, um, there are a lot of skepticism about the real intent of Europe, uh, to what extent they do really care about the just solution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And I will also say that the Azerbaijani government, of course for its own power point, uh, point of view, uh, uses this as an argument, but it must be admitted it is a rational argument and it's subjective truth. You have to do it. You have to deal with it. Uh, European Union officials are on record in saying that uh, in the discussions on this agreement and actually in the formulation of the agreement, uh, issues of uh, good governance and also uh, freedom of speech are going to be uh, important uh, elements that the European Union would like to see somehow included in the discussion. Uh, there is some perception uh, in Brussels that the space in Azerbaijan for free debate um, is shrinking rather than expanding. What do you think uh, can help uh, this process within the framework of EU-Azerbaijan relations? Uh, and th there's a second part to this question. When speaking to a number of uh, uh, civil society activists, we sometimes hear the message that the European Union should cut contacts with Azerbaijan. Do you agree with this? No, I, 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 I totally disagree in a way that uh, I think I already said that uh, the contacts should be uh, not only continued, but also deepened and widened. And negotiations should continue and uh, Azerbaijan EU relationship uh, or in, uh, European Union should engage Azerbaijan uh, in, 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 in those negotiations. But uh, the format should be carefully uh, framed. So far, it is only government to government uh, negotiations. And uh, uh, the European Union seem to uh, accept the government as the only. Uh, uh, holder of the process, of the shareholder of the process, which is not true. Uh, the Azerbaijani uh, civil society and especially Azerbaijani opposition has a lot to say in this context and should be engaged in those negotiations and context. In fact, there, there is a precedent for that. In the, in the 90s, when there was also no, not much uh, internal negotiations and context between government and opposition in Azerbaijan, uh, yet, at that time, European institutions effectively dealt with that problem by communicating with them separately. And then uh, they communicated the ideas and proposals which they got from the opposition to the government. Uh, and by, that, by doing so, they acted as a sort of mediator, which uh, was very unhappy in a way that it, it's not the way that it should be. But uh, given uh, the, the, the problematic situation in Azerbaijan, that was considered to be the only effective way. Uh, since then, uh, European institutions uh, ceased to do that. So now they talk only to government. And again, uh, when they talk to opposition or, or civil society, they, they talk on, on issues of humanitarian concern only. But uh, the European Union should find a way and explain it to the government uh, carefully that opposition needs to be part of this process. And that, I believe, would also uh, be uh, beneficial for the internal dialogue within the society of Azerbaijan. One should start with the major topics, with the general issues, uh, and then uh, internally we will continue them in details. But opposition must be part of this. Let me go uh, back to a point you raised uh, a moment ago regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the perception uh, is that uh, within Azerbaijan there is a lot of warmongering, that uh, this is a society that is actually clamoring for war. Is this a right perception or is it a misguided perception? And what can be done uh, to increase the discussion within Azerbaijani society about the actual different options that exist for a solution to the Karabakh uh, conflict, including uh, peaceful solutions that would necessarily require a certain amount of political compromise? 
Well, uh, my understanding of this, and I think uh, it somehow reflects uh, the general understanding within our society, is that the whole this process of, it could be within the Minsk group uh, for the last 20 years, uh, in Azerbaijan is viewed mainly as a, an attempt to contain Azerbaijan from using the force, which Azerbaijan is uh, perfectly entitled to under the Article 51 of the UN uh, Charter. But it doesn't mean that Azerbaijan is, uh, considers the war as the best option or the only option. Yes, uh, uh, war is uh, the least uh, desirable uh, option, but it is a legitimate option. And this should be always kept in mind. Um, because when Azerbaijan is expected uh, to, to give up uh, legitimate use of force as an option, um, then it is understood in our society uh, as an indication that uh, the, behind the doors, the conversation, negotiations are going not within the interest of the national, within the national interest of Azerbaijan, because it seems like uh, external players want to impose or impose their own view of the solution of the conflict, which doesn't seem to be uh, just. And by just, of course, uh, Azerbaijani society is rather peaceful and quite tolerant and uh, ready to, to, to contact, to have dialogues and negotiations. But Azerbaijani society, uh, there, there is no room for us to give up uh, uh, our territories. So territories should not be a part of the bargaining. Uh, the degree of the uh, self-governance in Nagorno-Karabakh, of course, uh, can be and should be uh, discussed, debated uh, and negotiated but only within the framework of territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, including Nagorno-Karabakh, as I said in, 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 the previous, uh, in one of the previous answers. And that is what Azerbaijan society expects from the European Union or, or NATO or individual members of those organizations, because we never heard that. Uh, uh, so, um, <clears throat> yes, uh, we, 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 we perfectly understand the old implications and all the difficulties of this uh, process. But uh, understanding is one thing, approaching with an understanding and another thing, uh, because we have never heard uh, uh, international organizations uh, uh, criticizing Armenia or actually demanding from Armenia to withdraw its troops, uh, which would be a, a first step and a very strong indication of the political will in Armenia that they really want to solve the conflict. And also that will be a strong indication of the uh, political will in the Minsk group, in the co among co-chairs, that they really want not just solve the conflict, but uh, to establish a just peace so that all sides can be satisfied. Um, but that satisfaction should not be at the cost of the national interest of Azerbaijan, uh, in terms of the loss of territory, uh, that's what I mean. So, uh, <clears throat> and that, uh, on Karabakh issue, there is a general understanding within the society of Azerbaijan. There is no opposition on that. Uh, it is because it is a national interest. So, um, uh, yes, until uh, mediators uh, are clear enough in sending their messages, these negotiations can continue for, uh, for, for many years uh, to come. Um, what seems to be, uh, uh, my understanding is that the West does want to solve a conflict, but they, the West doesn't want to take sides. Uh, Russia doesn't want to, have to solve the conflict because uh, then if any format of solving the, the, the conflict is not in the true strategical interest of Russia because when conflict is solved, then Russia will lose its leverage on both countries, Armenia and, and Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan uh, has always been, I don't like the phrase, but I mean, just I'm using it for simplicity reason. I know it's cliche, but anyway, has always been a, a sort of a pro-Western country. Uh, in the in, the, in the, uh, unlike Armenia, for example, which has always allied with Russia for its own security reasons, uh, which we also understand, but we're not approaching it with understanding anyway. Um, but one has to understand that uh, uh, the the major concern of Azerbaijan as a country. Uh, when it negotiates any agreement with the Europe or Western law in general, is Karabakh. 
and that's not going to change if the government changes. And the, unle- uh, the, the, the occupation uh, is a serious problem. It really hinders democratization in Azerbaijan in a certain way, not in a way that the government says, because I know that the government uses it for its own propaganda uh, purposes, but it's an objective problem. So uh, it's, it, it, it comes within the package. Also, uh, for Armenia, because Armenia is stuck. Armenia is, is a hostage of, of its own territorial claims toward Azerbaijan. Because, if I may say this to the, to the audience of, of, of this program, uh, if we go back to the end of 80s and beginning of 90s, when the whole conflict began, uh, Armenia wanted Karabakh at any price. We at that time wanted independence at any price. I mean independence from Moscow. When you want something at any price, you pay the highest price possible. So in the end what happened, Armenia got control of Karabakh but lost independence. They are fully dependent on Russia. Azerbaijan get, got its independence but lost control over Karabakh. So I believe that uh, a, a geostrategical uh, compromise should be somewhere there, should be uh, searched for in that issue. Because if Armenia really cares about its independence, or as I understand that uh, the young generation of Armenia uh, views Russia differently, or at least uh, expects its country to be less dependent on Russia, then they should understand that they have to agree uh, with Azerbaijan on Karabakh issue. And of course, Azerbaijan also, some, to a certain extent, has always been ready to compromise some of its foreign policy choices. Uh, not to make Russia angry, not to spoil the relations with Russia, but that also comes at a price. Uh, uh, and Azerbaijan, at a certain period of time, especially the ruling elite, was kind of hopeful that Russia could really facilitate the solution uh, of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict on Azerbaijani terms. But that didn't happen. So that's why uh, I think that it's uh, no longer a question. Yeah, okay, they keep uh, behaving nice to Russia, but I don't believe that they have changed their uh, geopolitical course. Okay, you are co-founder of the Vial movement. Uh, this movement uh, has been an important feature uh, in uh, Azerbaijani public life for the last few years. But your chairman and co-founder is currently uh, uh, in, in prison. Jail. And uh, the movement has big decisions to make going forward, whether it wants to turn itself into a political party, whether it's going to contest the next elections. Can you tell us uh, how you feel uh, Real can contribute to the future of Azerbaijan? Uh, now, in the process of transition from movement to full fledged political party, it's a difficult process and uh, it's a slow process, and it was also our decision to make it slow and careful so that not to repeat mistakes of other organizations and also not to create additional risks to our members. Uh, so, but slowly but surely we're moving toward that goal. Real uh, has an ambition uh, uh, to not only play a, uh, a certain role in the political uh, life of Azerbaijan, but as a Real has an ambition to once uh, become a, a government, to take responsibility for the country. Uh, so we're preparing ourselves for that. Uh, it's a strategy. Uh, and of course we have a program printed out and it's available on online. So anyone can uh, access the program and read it and uh, uh, learn what we stand for. Ilgam Mamadov is our leader, uh, as a potential candidate for presidency. Uh, and as the European Court for Human Rights uh, uh, wrote in its judgment on his case, uh, he was arrested. Uh, the purpose of Ilgar Mamadov's arrest was to shut him uh, and to uh, prevent his participation in the uh, presidential uh, election. So uh, it's the price uh, that Real, as a n- newly emerged uh, political organization, uh, pays uh, for its principled position 
um, and the real uh, attracts attention of younger generation over the other country. Uh, we do not discriminate our members and supporters on, on, on age, but uh, it just happened that uh, the younger generation uh, views as a as a potential uh, hope. Um, and uh, in fact, the, the expectations about real growing um, faster than we can control. So sometimes we have to uh, downgrade those expectations so that we can control them. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a lot to do in our future. Uh, we have uh, several plans uh, which we have already, some of which were published and declared. So people in Azerbaijan, uh, our supporters and sympathizers, uh, not to forget members, so all are we're aware of uh, what we're doing and what we stand for. Um, so this is it. Uh, we 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 uh, we believe that what we stand for is right, not only for our own purposes but also for the country's future. And uh, will they all be uh, contesting the next elections? And will you yourself be contesting the next? Elections? This is this has always been a, a, a part of our uh, tactics that we will use all uh, legally available political opportunities. Uh, to influence uh, people's minds and uh, to influence the political scene, uh, to try as far as possible and as far as we can to change the political uh, climate and atmosphere in Azerbaijan. So yes, we will participate in the elections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.